Okay. Just leave it. You can. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Frankie Slauson here uh, with a new season of uh, interviews for my uh, podcast channel for the Frankie Slauson Show channel. Uh, this year, this season, we're kicking off really big with an interview here uh, in Deadwood, South Dakota, with a legendary, well, legendary band, but we got one of the original members from the band. Uh, his name is Larry Wegan. We Wegan. We Wegan. Okay, because I for some reason I, I was saying Wegan or something like that. Nobody ever gets it right. Wegan. Yeah. Larry Wegan, and he's the original what, bassist for yeah. for the band Crow, the Minnesota rock and roll band Crow. They they came out uh, way back in what about the late sixties? Uh, Sixty nine to seventy two was was the original. Seven to was the original run before you? Yeah. Took a break and decided yeah. to come back and whatnot. Right. And uh, you guys are playing here in Deadwood, uh, just like a, is it like one of the lit last jams for a while, or, or just something you just got hooked on and you wanted to come play here? Well, we've always wanted to play here. We played here, you know, not for a long time, but in the early '70s, late '60s, we played here a number of times. Uh, made some friends, and then we. Haven't been in the area for a while. Uh, this is our last date on this summer tour that we've had this year. Okay. So uh, we're going to take a break after this. Uh, we all kind of are scattered throughout the U.S. now. So uh, uh, it'll be next summer before we play live again. So, oh, wow. Yeah. No, I was just kind of always kind of was just surprised because I seen your tour schedule on your website, you know, once I knew that you guys were coming. I was like, boy, you guys haven't done too many. It's good that you're back out there doing it, but you don't do too many gigs as much. No, uh, we're all involved with our own personal lives and our own uh, occupations outside of music, and and uh, but we do like to tour every summer when we can get everybody rounded up. Sure. And uh, so we have four of the original six members with us. Okay. So, uh, that's uh, one thing people ask us all the time if there are any, any more original members. It is is Dave still with you guys too? Yeah, Dave, the lead, sing, lead singer's name is Dave Wagner. He's with us, uh, our original keyboardist Hammond player, Dave Middlemas. We call him King. Uh, Chico Perez is our percussionist. Uh, those are the, and myself are the original guys. And we've had two other guys, uh, Norm Steffen on drums for the last 20 some years and uh, and our uh, guitarist uh, Jeff Christensen has uh, been with us since the 80s. Oh so, wow. So we've been together a long time. Oh yeah, it seems like a one big happy happy family when it comes to making music. Uh, uh, have you, uh, well let, let's kind of let's go backwards a little bit instead of going, going forward. Uh, you guys started, what was it about, you said 1969? Well, our, we, were put, earlier than that. we put that group together under a different name in 1967. It started in January of 67 through August. We put a group together that was from two groups from Minneapolis. We took members from each band and, and formed a group called South 40 in 1967. And then we did a, a couple of records uh, as that group. And then we changed drummers in 1969. And, and uh, we got our new producers out of Chicago, and we changed the name to Crow because it fit better, because our old name was, sounded like a country band. Which, <laughs> we're not a, we don't do country music. But, no. but how, how, how the how the name Crow even come up? Because that's kind of, I mean, there's a lot of odd bad names, that ha or a lot of bands that have a lot of different names that are, whether they're animal names or, or just weird names or whatever. Why the Crow name? Well, uh, we were trying to find an, a, a simple name that would people would get an image of, like, you know, the Eagles. You know, sure. Eagles are the Eagles. Okay, uh, this is before the Eagles, but we were trying to keep it simple and also uh, uh, somehow connect to the music, and the music is basically blues rock orientated. So we didn't want to get, like, a bluebird, so we got, a, we got, got the name of Crow came up. Our drummer actually came up with the idea of Mother Crow, and in, back in those days there was Mother Mother Love and Mother Earth and Mother This, and he came up with Mother Crow. We went, oh, how about just Crow? So that's how it popped out, and, it, and we've kept it ever since. Well, it seems like a name that really stuck with a lot of people. I'm sure 
when they first heard it, they probably thought, well, that's a pretty cool name anyway. I mean, I don't think too many people would question why you would, why you would call it that, but uh, uh, I just, you know, like nowadays, I mean, of course, this was back in the days before all, well, all these bands that we got now, you know, that have came up and, you know, and, and done their thing, but Crow's a pretty cool name, I think. Pretty cool. Kind of represents everybody. Yeah, it's it, in a way. It, it, I agree with you. I think it's an easy name to remember, and especially yeah. the style of music we got. We we like to think it fits the music style more than, you know, like say, you know, Finch. Oh sure, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So you you got your you, you did everybody was everybody from Minnesota that originally uh, was a part of the band? Well, uh, all of us are from the Twin City area. Uh, the original band you're talking about? Yeah, well, I mean, just when you first started, like everybody. When yeah. we first started, uh, yeah, uh, two guys for, were from the north side of, of Minneapolis, and I'm, uh, me and my brother Dick was the original guitarist, and the drummer, Denny Craswell, were all from Richfield, Minnesota, which is the south side of Minneapolis, basically, okay. suburbs. Southern, southern. Another thing is, Denny used to play in a group called uh, The Castaways. And they had a song called Liar Liar back oh, in the Oh, sure, early. sure, sure. Okay, but he was the drummer on that. And we, were, we when we got him is when we made this switch over on the name and we recorded with him. And, uh, oh, that's um, cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I, I remember the castaways. Uh, Riff, uh, or not Riff, Rick uh, Shefchik yeah, did Rick. a book yeah. just recently about uh, the Minnesota bands. And, and you guys are obviously mentioned... Uh, did uh, when Rick decided to do it, and then we're kind of just jumping around here a little bit. But when Rick asked you to be, did he ask you guys to be a part of the, the book or whatnot? Or, uh, or? Uh, he had been doing that for a while, that project. And yeah, he he talked to us. He talked to me and a guy named Lonnie Knight. Lonnie Knight was a guy I used to work with. Sure. And one of the bands that came from that we got from a group called the Ravons, me and Lon Nate used to play well he talked to us and he talked to him, numerous uh, musicians in the Twin City area from sure. the early to mid sixties era. Yeah. yeah. I suppose like uh, Buddy Holly was probably one of your big inspirations to for the band because it seemed like Buddy Holly inspired a lot of people, uh, even uh, well while even while he was alive, you know, to, to do music, let alone after he died. Well, uh, you mean when we first started? Yeah, right? yeah. Well, when you're talking about the Ravens and stuff like that, because that sounds like a name you get from Buddy Holly. Well, that's one of his songs. Yeah, <laughs> everybody gets that. And as a matter of fact, yeah, that was uh, that was the inspiration to that name of that band. Was we did a lot of early. We did Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly, Bo Diddley, Jimmy Reed. We did a lot of BB King. We were rock and blues band. Uh, but Buddy High was real, real uh, big in our, in our book, and uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, we were big Buddy Holly fans. Oh sure, oh sure, and I, you know, I, I always kind of wished I was around during those times, you know, just to see what life was like and see what how big the music industry really was, even, even in the early starts of rock and roll, because a lot of people, I'm, from what I've heard anyway, a lot of your straightforward people didn't really understand rock and roll. They didn't, they thought it was like the devil's music and stuff. And was it still like that in the sixties? Kind of a lot of people were against uh, well, blues or rock and roll. Or you're something. talking about our parents. When yeah, we were younger. Yeah, parents, yeah. Parents, there parents. was there were still. I mean, that went on even when the Beatles came along. They thought those guys were some evil <laughs> thing from outer space. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they were still listening to Frank Sinatra and you know those kind of bands and, and when Elvis came out and the band mm -hmm. Eddie Cochran my guys were Eddie Cochran and the Everly Brothers yeah those were the guys that I like uh, everybody was freaking out about Elvis and I thought he was good but you're right everybody thought you know it was there was just uh, some kind of devil music and that's what I mean it's like you know it just it makes I mean I, I mean I get I get why but it's just like uh, wouldn't you figure some some people would come come around to it because it's almost like with like how big the wrestling industry was, you know, like pro wrestling was, like the AWA and all that stuff. And you see uh, vintage footage of all these parents and older people that were, you know, let alone kids, but parents and grandparents who like wrestling, who go to these shows and all that stuff and see everybody get beat up and whatnot, but yet they'd be against their rock and roll music or, or whatever, you know? well, or, or whatever, or they say they would. 
When, when me and my brother uh, got into music, it was the late 50s, actually. We were pretty young, and uh, it, it was a different time. The 50s were a different time, totally. And, you know, once the 60s came around and uh, Jack Kennedy got elected, and all of a sudden it was a page was turned. And sure. It's a new day. And, but the parents were still uh, worried about their kids. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, when you guys got together, how long did it take to, to, to record your first few songs? Well, okay, the original band in 1967, uh, we put out two or three singles that were locally um, being played in, in the five-state area. Not so much on this end of the Dakotas, but uh, Fargo to do it okay. with in Minneapolis, down yeah. south. Uh, that, that was uh, a thing that took... We did that initially right away. We put singles out right away, and they were being airplayed, which helped our gigging schedule. And oh, you and, got and some local local airplay, like from some local DJs. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and that helped our live concerts. Uh, in March of 1968, a year later, we we did a live recording at, at, at a place called Someplace Else. That's in that book. You sure, sure, sure. Uh, and then uh, and then uh, that. You know, after that, we kind of focused on writing original material. We did some original stuff on that album. And we were trying to land a bigger label. That's what we were trying to do. And and that's what happened. We In 69, it, uh, it, we got a producer that that used to produce the Buckinghams and oh. groups, groups like the Shadows of Night and out of Chicago. But he liked what he heard. So that's how we got more into writing our own material more and more towards the latter part of the 60s. But we had been doing it. We had been writing our own stuff all along. So, so it probably took a little bit to, to get your, your first hit, uh, Evil Woman, or, or was that not your first hit? Well, nationally speaking, <coughs> nationally, that would, yeah, that everybody could hear. Yeah, that, would, that was our second release as Crow. Our first release, we didn't want to release, but the record company thought they were that was the way to go, but we didn't agree with them. And, and sure. it turns out that a station in Seattle that was being uh, that was pushing what they called underground music at them days, uh, not on the top forty yet, but uh, new stuff, you know. And uh, they flipped it over. Well, Evil Woman was on the flip side of this forty-five, and as soon as they flipped it over, all of a sudden it took off. And how how did uh, how did it get so popular to where Black Sabbath wanted to cover? Or well, Ozzy Osbourne wanted to cover it. How, how did that connection happen? Well, Tina Turner did it too. Okay. She, she did it the same year. The same yeah, sir, you were talking about that on your page or whatnot. Or, or well, yeah, people don't realize that. Do you remember that uh, Black Sabbath's first album, their first single, was a cover of The Old Woman. And uh, remember uh, that Tina Turner, uh, where she did Roll On the River? Yeah, and everybody seems to know that song. It's, her album's called Come Together. That's a, It came out in 1970. It's on that album. Okay. And the Black Sabbath one is on their first album that was only released in England. But what they released here, what, it wasn't on that album. Oh. Because they knew we just had a hit with it. So yeah. they wanted to have a hit over there with it. So that's... But I mean, like, how, how did they... I mean, how did the transition from you guys being just, you know, like a local Minnesota band to get a little bit of recognition and then they just, like... Uh, or even Tina Turner, and then eventually. Well, it, it was. It came down to that song was all of a sudden got picked up by a lot of radio stations. Once the Seattle guys wow. started pushing it, all of a sudden it got on Billboard and Cashbox, and the, and then all the radio stations picked it up. And these, Tina Turner and Black Sabbath were looking for strong signals that they could do, that were. If you notice, they did song. They redid songs that were hits, like. The, the Creedence Clearwater Oh, song. sure, sure, sure. That's what they did. Black Sabbath didn't. They, yeah, I barely hear them do any covers at all. Well, I don't think they did much after ours. I don't know why. <laughs> they, I don't think they really... I think they got talked into that. Their producers talked to our producers. Okay. And that's how the deal got done. So did Ozzy ever say, I want to meet these Crow guys? Oh, well, so, I would love to meet them all. I would love to. Well, I mean, like... like so that never ever happened. You guys never got together and said, "Hey, I want to jam with these guys." And you know, just we never met. We never met Ozzy or anybody. Uh, I get that question a lot. Oh, I'm sure. Met. I'm sure you do. But uh, we I'll never start. actually physically met them. Met them anywhere, but uh, okay. It's 
you know, met a lot of other great people, but not not Ozzy or Oh, sure. Yeah. I just think it'd just be kind of kind of a coincidence because it's just like you know, you got these big, even bigger than life superstars or singers that want to. I mean, that's cool that they. You know, I'm sure once you heard that they were going to do your do your the cover of it. I mean, did that surprise you at all? Did that make you think? Well, no, I'd be really big superstars if they do this or whatever. No, it was it was an it was an honor for them to cover. Up to we felt it was a, a very cool thing. Yeah, cool. and I've heard their version many times. You know, it's very similar to you guys's. You know, pretty yeah. much, pretty much a, 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 a pretty much just a, a, a good copy of it. That's what it, we our producers put horns on our track. Yeah. Well, when we recorded it, it sounded without. If you can imagine what it sounds like without horns, that's how they sound. They sound. Ozzy did it the way we did it, and then our producers put horns on our track okay. to make it more commercial. So oh they sure. Have a hit. You know? <laughs> yeah. So that's what yeah. they were going for, and that's that. He was good at. They were good at it. They did. They did the uh, you know kind of a drag. They did the bucking ends with horns, and that was Chicago in them days. That's what they did. That was the reason behind it. But, uh, yeah, theirs is very similar to ours. Now, like, when you guys started doing, your, like, touring, like, how far did you go? I mean, did you guys get enough national recognition where you got to go all over America and eventually overseas and stuff? Never, we, never, we were on our way to Spain. We never made it to Europe. We, ne we, 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 never, we played in Canada. We, we haven't played in Mexico. Uh, all our, uh, we did a lot of uh, records in Mexico and overseas, but... Uh, no, by the time we stopped touring, uh, we had toured all over the U.S. numerous times with many really good bands of that era. I can name five of them, Chicago, Three Dog Night, uh, groups like that, you know, that were real popular at the time. Uh, War, oh God, Neil Diamond, I, can, I can't remember them all. There's just, there's just so many. A lot. A lot of them. He's got, he's got two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. Okay. And I'm glad you're keeping, keeping up with that. I need somebody to be the camera guy. Because yeah. the camera only records up to 20 minutes pieces. I don't know why, but I okay. need a better camera anyway. No, we're happy to be here. This oh, is, this is going to be a lot of fun. I was down looking at the site today, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's, uh, that's what's uh, great about uh, the fact that you guys finally made, your, made an appearance over here. Because I just like, you know... I've always been, you know, I, I would I would love to attend tomorrow, but I have to work, or else I would see you guys uh, perform live. Uh, do you guys do a lot of solos and stuff, or, or what's in a typical crow? What's a typical crow concert like? We do uh, anywhere from forty-five minutes to an hour and a half, um, depending on what they ask us to do. Uh, sure. We probably could do more than that. Uh, we mix it up. We do, uh, you know, I'd say sixty percent of it is our own original stuff. And then we cover uh, like a, an old animal song. We cover a Solomon Burke song. These are blues songs. Um, remember that song, We Gotta Get Out of This Place? Yeah, yeah. Well, we do our version of that. And we do some other things. We do a Dixie Dregs song that we love, and we just like playing it. Oh, um, sure, it's sure. It's a great instrumental. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but... Um, well, you know, there's a lot of old, oldies. I, I grew up on oldies, even being a young guy like myself. But I, I, that's what I was raised on. And I kind of... I've always had a passion for older music. That's why I think it's so good when I, you know, I get kind of emotional when I see like these kids who are, you know, talented enough to play instruments and stuff, and, and they want to take the arts away from everybody, you know, when they do their budget cuts and stuff, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah, so. Oh, okay. All right. And you, what, I want, what I was going to do is we're going to finish the interview. Uh, do you think you could... And go. And we're back here with Larry Wiggins <coughs> and uh, from Crow, the original bassist from Crow, and uh, uh, appreciate having you on the, the show. I mean, Thank really glad to be here. kicking off the new season of interviews. You know, there's a lot, lot of tribute bands that I'm going to be talking to here soon, and other entertainers. And you're, it's nice that we can kick it off with a musician, an original musician that's been around for quite a long time. Uh, we were uh, in the break. We we're talking about your your album that you just released. Well. Uh, Along with the Crow stuff, I've, I'm involved with the Twin City music scene, which is real active, very active, very supportive. And over the last, since Crow started in the 70s, late 60s, I've done numerous sessions with different people. And what I did was I put a collection of about 12 songs 
throughout each decade. On the CD that I played bass on, it's not all Crow stuff. There are two Crow songs on there, but there's also a couple of adventures that I recorded with and some local guys um, that you probably don't know of, but they're really big in the area. And I call the, the album or the CD Sessions, which is basically copies of these sessions that I've been doing. And I also have those Crow th CDs that these will be for sale uh, on Saturday too, if sure. anybody wants it. Sure, sure. Uh, you also were saying that you uh, you like to do play with other bands. You play with a lot of different bands. Yeah, I, I played with Corey Stevens. Uh, I, know, band. I know Corey. I know Corey Stevens. Yeah. yeah, I played with him for a couple of years, and I played. Well, I played with. Remember the band Pacific Gas and Electric? I. My, this was back yeah. in the Crow days. Oh, okay. Late sixties. They had a big hit. They were a national band. What was their big song? Are you ready? It's called. Are, Are you, you ready? ready? Yeah, maybe hey, possibly. You've heard it. I know you've heard I it. I probably have. And uh, locally in Minneapolis, I work with Lisa Winger Band. I work with Mick Sterling. I work with Mary Jane Ohm. Uh, these are all pretty well-known uh, vocalists in the Twin City area. I work with groups like Gypsy. Do you remember oh, Gypsy? I, yeah, I think no, I've heard okay. of Gypsy. That's another band. Um, uh, just there's just it's a real active music scene, so you can stay. As a bassist, I get hired out with different projects, and that's what that's about. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Keeps you keeps you going anyway. Because well, yeah. your professional job other than music, working for an airline or something like that. Or? Well, I worked for American Airlines for twenty five years. Okay. I was uh, what they call a ramp rat, basically in Minneapolis. <laughs> I started out loading airplanes. I ended up uh, running a computer, and doing weights and balances, huh. and, and stuff like that, and. Uh, I suppose your main passion was you would love to make a living just doing music, I suppose. Oh, yeah, all the, the whole time I worked there, I was still playing music. And uh, those are my two passions, aviation. Oh. Well, history, aviation, and music, those are my... So you never got to be like the, the Sully or whatever, got to fly and everything, got to fly a plane? Oh, right? I've, I've flown a few. Yeah? Oh. Yeah, but I never had to do anything like that. Oh, no, 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 no. But I mean, like, you know, just fly planes, like, you know, be the, be the pilot or whatever. I never, I never flew, a, not for American. I was a ground guy, but I mean, I've flown uh, small ones with oh. friends of mine. And, you go up and, uh, and I suppose working for American Airlines, you get some benefits. You get to travel a little bit, probably, or two, I suppose. You know, like, in your retirement or whatever, you get to, if you want to go on a plane ride or whatever, they'll say, hey, sure, well. Okay, well, if they got room, they'll put me on. Yeah. That's the trouble. You don't never know if you're going to actually get on an airplane. But it is, it, they, it's part of the benefit package when you retire. They, uh, they made it, it was a good company for me to work for. Oh, when sure. I was raising my kids and stuff, was so I needed stability, and they were, they were a very good company, so I was happy. When you were touring with, uh, with Crow, I mean, uh, what were some of your favorite places to go? Well, we played Fillmore West. We played the whiskey out there. Uh, favorite places, boy, that's a hard. A lot of, a lot of. Well, man, wow. I, I got a lot of favorite places. Uh, <laughs> this is one of my. I love the Black Hills area. Yeah. I, I've always loved this area. You ever, ever played Sturges at all for the rally? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, I played Sturges and. Uh, we used to play it in the Rapid City at the old auditorium. Do you remember this? I, I've only been Rapid for about three years. Todd's been here a lot longer than I have. Well, there used to be like, a, I want to say, an auditorium or a sort of a arena that we used to play at. And we, we met a lot of local players and people that were music lovers back then. We kind of lost track of them because we hadn't played it here in a while. But they used to come out all the time, and we had a great time. It was, uh, but, yeah, favorite places? Boy, I don't know. They were we played in... Uh, my favorite pl things were like Toronto Pop Fest, uh, you know, these Miami Pop Festivals, uh, Seattle Pop Festivals, sure. uh, the Moondance stuff. Oh, yeah, uh, Moondance Jam, yeah. We had a chance to play at Woodstock. Um, we were on our way back from New York. We were in Cheyenne going to Seattle to play a festival, and we got a call saying they're going to have some festival in New York. Do you want to play it? And I said, we just left New York. I said, we're going to Seattle. So they said, okay. That was the end of it, and I found out later it was Woodstock, so I thought, wow. wow. so you guys could have been on there. It could have definitely uh, impacted your career like it has a lot of the people who perform who have performed on there. It seems like everybody's career who performed on there went really big. Like, they got almost, almost everybody got national attention. Yeah. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they didn't really explain it. They probably, 
the, the, I don't know how long they did the planning for this, but it seemed like they just kind of threw it together and you know didn't really prepare nobody, anybody. Yeah, nobody expected that. We were on our way to play with Johnny Winters in Chicago and Chambers Brothers and I don't know who else was on that. They were playing with Del Shannon or anything like that. Was, uh, I love Freddie Shannon. Boom Boom Cannon. Freddie Boom Boom Cannon. Recorded with John Park, Denver. Yeah. Uh, okay. I recorded with. Playing with a lot of folks over there. I'm uh, old enough to know. Bob Dylan, that all? Any uh, connection with him from because of Minnesota? I never actually played on anything he played with. So, uh, although I played with his either his nephew or his cousin, but I've never mm. played with him. No, I know some of his family members back in Minnesota. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Because I think uh, I don't know if his son's band, the Wallflowers, is still doing anything, but uh, but I remember yeah. the Wallflowers. Anyway. Oh, Jake Dylan, it's great. I like them a lot. I like that band a lot. Yeah. yeah. I do like them. Yeah. I suppose when you were impacted just like everybody else was when Prince died, I mean, this is not a crow, crow question, but Minnesota related. Oh, absolutely. We're all, that's what I'm talking about. That community is amazing because I've lived in LA and Chicago and spent a lot of time in New York. And the music community in Minnesota is really amazing. It's like really cohesive. Uh, yeah. You get it at other places, you're very competitive. But there, and we, yeah, we knew Prince, and uh, I know the guys from the time. I play with the guys from the time all the time. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but... The Gestures, they were playing anything oh, yeah. with them? Yeah, just, I, I talk to them all the time. I yeah. would see the Rick, Rick, Rick in his book, you know, was talking highly about the Gestures, because, I mean, because they, after they did a... I, I did an interview with him last year, so that's how I know about him, and, and, do, and did, discovered all this stuff or whatnot, mm -hmm. about four Minnesota bands, and I knew that there were. Uh, he, with his book, uh, everybody or, or everybody's heard, uh, book about the rock and roll or bands from the '60s or '70s or the Minnesota rock bands that don't get enough recognition. I think uh, he was talking about the gestures and he was talking about the trash band and of course he talked about you guys a little bit. But they, on the release party, they had like I think the gestures come out and play a couple songs or whatever. Well, Do there's little... there's only two originals left, but yeah. Oh, there. Two of them have died. One guy was a Vietnam vet that, that had Agent Orange that caught caught up to him. He survived the war, but he sure. didn't survive that. And uh, the other guy, uh, I'm not sure what happened with him. Tommy was a helicopter pilot, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if he died over there or not. But um, uh, yeah, when I started playing music in 1961, I, I kind of recall there was maybe 20 bands that I had heard of at the time in Trashman were called uh, Jim Thaxter and the Travelers. This is before the Trashman. So, and, and groups like that. Um, and uh, by the time I graduated from high school in 65, there was 500 bands. It went from nothing to, by the time, and the Beatles had a lot to do with that in the 64 sure. on. But early on, there wasn't that many groups that I was aware of. Anyway. Oh, wow. And, and that's, what, that's what Dale, you talked to Dale meant. Yeah. About the gestures. Well, that's what he was getting at was the, the guys that did play all knew about each other. And if somehow that's, you know, that that's still going on. So, so they like to do festivals and concerts together and stuff like that. Because it seems like, it seems like if, a, if a band knows about another band, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll befriend those people and then they'll start doing festivals and stuff together and, and just help, you know, help each other, help each other be successful. Well, I, I wouldn't know. If, I wouldn't call it helpful. They're they're supportive. Okay. I don't think I don't think they're out of way. To well, I mean, like put in a good word for you. Say, yeah. hey, I know this manager or whatever. I know this guy. He could he could book you here. He could yeah, that here. happens a lot. And the other that's the other thing. And there was three or four good booking agencies that could take you to a, a, a upper level locally speaking. They couldn't break you out of there. That would take. Uh. Well, we had to we had to go to Chicago to make that happen, but. They would keep a lot of people working in, in everything from school dances to VFWs to proms to clubs sure. to colleges, we, ballrooms. I mean, we were working all over the place. And that was really healthy as far as developing uh, your craft, basically. Do you remember the biggest audience you ever played for? The one I remember was the Toronto Pop Festival. That were, there was 70,000 people. Yes. And... Uh, we just played at Moondance with 
Just this last August, we, oh. we didn't play. I was yeah. with Lisa's band, and that was sixty-two thousand. Jeez. And that was that's quite an experience. Did you play days. any crow tunes just to get people to record no. to know? No. No. I play her sets and whatever. People, however, mouth though, you'd be surprised. Oh. I'll say, <laughs> they spot one of us and they smile or something. So you get that local celebrity type of recognition out here and there, uh, unexpectedly sometimes, I'm sure. It surprises the hell out of me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, do you think social media has helped a lot when it comes to uh, certain artists that, uh, even independent artists that aren't that probably wouldn't get enough attention if they didn't uh, have social media to help them with gigs or, or whatever? I think it's helped, especially the older uh, groups that you might have not have heard of. Remember that song, Video Killed the Radio yeah, Star? Well, yeah. we were the radio stars. Yeah. And when video yeah. came out, you had to look better than you sounded. And That's we true. didn't really yeah. we didn't really care about how we looked. We just wanted to sound good, and we weren't going to win any beauty contests. <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, I think I think social media is a double edged sword in a lot of areas, and, and the same with promoting music and old and new music. I don't like the caliber of a lot of what they call pop music now. Yeah. Um, because of that, I think I think people are more interested in making sure their hair is cut right rather oh, than sure. they're to sing or something. You know, I I think they ought to work on their craft more than their look. Uh, they got looks important, but uh, well, that's we, why a lot of people you know look and dress the way they did because they're like ugly people made the best music. It seems like. What are you but, saying? Well, I, I heard some quote or whatever on Facebook, like, you know, I wish it was like back to the days when ugly people made music and it didn't matter about their looks or whatever, it just mad about how they could play and, and well, whatever. You I know? think that's how we looked at it. I mean, Elvis was a good looking guy. Yeah. And the Beatles were all good looking people. And, you know, and they I were mean, still, a lot of people were so good looking, but it's just, yeah. but it was more about their talent. It was, their talent stood out more. Than yeah. That. What, there's, there's exceptions to that now. I, I'm not down on new music, believe me. I love artists and I hope. I've hoped for the best, but but I notice a distinct uh, difference in the quality of the musicians here, especially the yeah. players. Um, and I'm talking about pop music now. The blues guys and the jazz guys, the country guys, are all great players. But um, but I'm finding that the young, the younger, especially guitarists or people that write rock songs, uh, are really uh, they could go do themselves a favor. And just you know, dig into their craft a little bit more can only help them. Oh sure. And I, that's good for me too. Oh yeah. It's just good advice that I got a long time ago, and and I agree with it. So oh, absolutely. Now you guys, uh, how uh, how many like uh, albums did you make as a with with Crow anyway? Well, the original, the original thing was that South Forty album, and then there was three that we put out in two years, and then they, the record company put out a best of, which is part of the, the three. Sure. So we did three original albums, the South 40 album, which was mostly original, and then the record company decided to do that. Now since then, you'll see our stuff being copied all over, which we never get paid for, by the way. It just happens. Oh, even on uh, Spotify, you don't get the royalties well, or anything? Well, somebody's getting it. I don't know who it is, but that's the double-edged sword part. That, sure. That cause it's so easy to uh, take advantage of that. There's, people, there's, people. there's an album that I've seen called Colors. Is that like an album you guys did? Well, that's a song I wrote. But, oh, okay. And, they, and I've seen that. Uh, it's got nothing to do with us. Somebody yeah. put that out and whoever's selling that, I, it doesn't go to us. It goes oh, to some, I'm not sure where it goes. But. Huh. So you probably have a lot of stuff on the online that you don't even, you're not even aware of probably. Huh? I thought artists have to approve all this stuff if they want their stuff on their on the internet. And stuff. If I was Bob Dylan, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not. Or Greg Kidd, because Greg Kidd uh, kind of decided that he wanted to own all his music too. Well, I think it's a great idea. I made I had some made some mistakes when I was early, and I signed some stuff that I guess I I couldn't tell you, but it, yeah, I, it seems like that's what I gave up when I signed it. In order to get a record out, I would oh, sign sure. something. Sure. Well, in the legalese, there's that little thing that says, "Oh, we can copy this." And, you know, when you're 19, you don't know what Yeah, that. they're offering you a good, a good contract. And so you're like, yeah. hey, I'll take whatever you can give me. I was happy. <laughs> I was just happy we, people wanted to record us, and uh, we, were, we were fortunate uh, that way. But, you know, everybody has a, has a regret here and there. And yeah. I don't have very many as far as our group goes. Well, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. And still going strong even after all these years, you know. And, uh, I mean, 
What's the future of Crow look like? Are you just going to do just more stuff during the summer times until, well, until you don't want to do it no more? Or just well, light? we have one guy in Texas most of the year, one guy's in Phoenix, and okay. uh, one, uh, two, three of us are in the Twin City area that are involved with other projects. So the, the problem is scheduling and getting everybody corralled. And we can only do that in the summer, and next year it'll be the summer and the fall. So we'll probably be playing more. I'd like to come back out here next oh, fall. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, or in the summer. Uh, we have some ideas about recording, but, you know, as groups like ours, it's not like you, you, we're trying to have another hit record. Oh, you know sure. know what I mean? Because it's, it, it's a different different deal nowadays. Um, Probably if you're going to do it, you want to do it still because you love making music. And exactly. Everything. It'd be We're just going to release stuff that we want. We want to do our thing to it, and if you want it, here it is. Yeah. We're not trying to get a hit record, but here it is. So People will probably realize that you guys have had success in your own special ways, and, and it's not, you know, like back in the day when you were first learning about the craft, sure, you, you wanted to make as much money, and, and, and not only that, but you wanted to, you didn't know how, where it was going to take you. Now you have an idea of where it took you, and you're, you're happy where it took you, and, and now you can just do it because you, you know, you want to do it. Well, there or, are, or you want to do it even more now, probably. I think it, I think we're having more fun with it now. It's not. Yeah. Like, it's not like we have to. Uh, we were under any pressure now, like we were then. We were under a lot of. Once you have a hit, yeah, you have a lot of pressure to come up with three or four more, and it's very hard to do that. Uh, it's, it's extremely hard to do that. Now, I have my hats off to the Eagles and the Beatles and those kind of bands. Um, they had hit after hit after hit. That's hard to do. Uh, anyway. Uh, I was going to say, people your age, um, uh, a few people your age and younger are interested in this kind of music, but mostly the people that buy stuff that my age want want the older stuff. They don't want new stuff. Well, they'll buy it, but they're really yeah. looking for the older stuff. Sure. So that's kind of where that's going as far as I see it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if we had another something that hit again, I'd be shocked. <laughs> Probably get you on like uh, nighttime TV or something like that, like Jay Leno or not Jay Leno, Jimmy Kimmel or something like that, or Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> I'm working with people now that are trying to do just that. This gal, Lisa Winger, is, yeah. is, she's uh, she's a very good singer, and uh, she's a younger gal that really she's got the fire in her belly about. She really she wants to entertain. She wants to get sure. on stage. She's very fired up about it. She's real good at it. So, oh yeah. So, but we're no, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not in that race anymore. Now, see, I've all, you know, I, I, I've always appreciated guys like, like you just because of, of the passion. And, and, you know, I don't like people that sell out. You know, there's so many people that sell themselves out, especially now with the way the music industry is now. You really literally have to sell your soul to almost to the devil himself in order to get what you, you know, to get, to hope you get what you want or whatever. And when people can just be themselves and make music because they want to, even if they're contracted to, I think it's just great that people, the music that you guys make, you know, can, can impact a generation of people. And, and while there's not many, uh, maybe a lot of young people that know, okay, not many young people that know of you guys, but maybe their parents will teach them or, or something. Well, there's, you probably noticed there's a difference in music these days. You know? and just like there was a difference in the 60s to the 40s. I mean, yeah. there's just, it's a different time, a different energy, a different... People write differently now than we did in the '60s. I still write that way, oh, yeah. but but people nowadays, uh, you know, they write different kinds of songs for different reasons. Well, I appreciate having you on here, Larry, and thank you very, thank you very much. much. This was an honor, and uh, you know, go check out Crow's music. Go check out Larry's music. It's uh, you can search it on Google. So, you know, do do some research, or if you haven't learned much from this interview, go do some research on Crow. You'll find some really cool uh, information. I guarantee it. So thank you. This has been Frankie Slauson, uh, the Frankie Slauson Show podcast with Larry, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.